Okay, so look, we, we all know the meme, or I hope are at least aware of the meme that was The Good Doctor, a show about an autistic surgeon that deals with how they interact and engage with the world around them, the hook being the fact that they are autistic. You know, like how House has the hook that he's an asshole, and Scrubs has the hook that he is just a dude, I guess. But what I want to focus on here is the episode which originated the sudden rise in popularity of people talking about Season 1, Episode 14's She, which deals with a transgender girl coming into the hospital and then discovering that she has testicular cancer, and how the good doctor, whose actual name I discovered is Sean Murphy, for future reference, deals with their own internalised transphobia and clinging to outdated modes of gate-kept thinking in regards to their patients. Why am I doing this, you might be asking? What's the point, apart from another famous show that had a trans episode? And, to be honest, I thought that was enough for you people. I, I thought that this whole channel was just about doing trans episodes. But, but, to be honest, what I really wanted to know was if the episode was as bad as we were led to believe that it was. Because the memes and the viral side that we saw did try to make it seem as if the show was displaying a very transphobic attitude, but in reality, what we saw was at most a minute of a 40-minute show. So I wanted to know if the impression we got was true to the actual message and overarching narrative that was written. That's, that's the question we're going to be answering in this video, so, you know... Preamble over. I also want to quickly, and that's a joke I know because this is going to be quite a bit, go over something that will come up infrequently throughout this analysis, and that is the way that Sean is written as an autistic person. Because one big side of the recent Good Doctor virality was the way that many people questioned the validity of the autism representation, and also how a lot of people seemed to be mocking qualities that the character displayed that are things autistic people deal with. Like this was some easy way to say some ableist shit and get away with it. From what I've researched, this is quite complex. There is the initial major issue of how it portrays savant syndrome, this rare condition wherein people with various developmental disorders can display a significantly improved ability or talent in a particular field. And in media, it can be the way that it's used to show that autistic people are in fact useful to society. This is an unfortunate continuation of a lot of innate ableist rhetoric and also some eugenic theory that rates people's acceptance and support by how valuable they are, rather than recognising that every person has value purely by existing in the first place. You're a human and you, one of the big rights you get is that you get to exist, that's it. You've done it. Just by existing, you've earned the right to exist. The show plays into this somewhat through the way that other characters engage with Sean and how they discuss or go over his role in regards to his savant syndrome. With it being kind of clear that the savant thing is a big reason they keep him around or tolerate him and his difficulties. Are you the autistic one? No. That's me, Dr. Sean Murphy. At least at first. The second major issue is that the actor, Freddie Highmore, based a lot of his portrayal on the organisation Autism Speaks, an organisation which has a very infamous standing amongst the autistic community due to the way that they present autism as an illness slash disease that can be cured, and they try and define individuals by their autism as well as not using a majority of their funding to go towards the necessary elements of supporting families and providing family grants, which is a necessity for helping those who are trying to provide an environment that is conductive towards their autistic child slash children, instead dedicating it towards getting more funding and also research into early detection in the womb and harmful therapies, both of which tie into that eugenic theory stuff we mentioned earlier. Oh, they also pay their top executives 600000 annually, which is just a little icing on the cake there for you. 
These are all big problems that have to be acknowledged before we get into the episode at question, because we are dealing with an intersection here of autistic and trans representation. And while an increased awareness of autism issues and tendencies did come about from The Good Doctor, and a lot of people did find it to be helpful, we also have to be aware of the flawed influences and historical bigotries going into that representation. And the link goes even further than just having an influence on the actor's portrayal, including a specific shout-out to the organisation from the show. And there are numerous articles and blogs on the Autism Speaks site which promote the show in turn. A beneficial relationship between two different things who've engaged in harmful reductiveness of autistic people and their lives in an attempt to push a certain narrative. Hi there. Since I've joined the cast of The Good Doctor, I've learned much more about the history of autism than I never knew about before, how perceptions and diagnoses have changed over time. Now, this isn't to say that the show is entirely just an Autism Speaks front, because that might have been true in the early season, at least when they were most influenced by them and consulting with them, but for the later seasons they had a specific consultant on the show named Melissa Reiner, who, as discussed in the academic paper Autism, Aliens and Astrophysicists, the perpetuation of the image of the non-social autistic through popular media, can be seen as being responsible for the way that the show had success with portraying autistic people in a manner that can be relatable, and also presented their autism as not something that they needed to just develop out of, but that other characters needed to compromise with them over. What I am trying to get at here, except for the fact that I did a ton of research on this because I really wanted to not insult or hurt anybody, is that The Good Doctor clearly still embodies some autistic stereotypes that exist within mass media, and shows the influence of the very popular and heavily involved Autism Speaks. But at the same time, there exist other influences and efforts by the actor and the showrunners to incorporate autism in a way that can be seen by some as good representation. The show has flaws and successes, and hopefully this is nuanced and talked about enough at this point that I can avoid getting reamed by all sides of this fandom and hate them for the show. Oh, and on a completely random personal note here, the only person I can speak for being myself of course, I do somewhat connect with the character being played here. Their bluntness and direct questions are not because they're an asshole, it's because how else are they supposed to get the answers or get across what they want to? I relate to that, and to the difficulty we've been able to interpret other people's complex social distinctions and cues. It's not freaking easy. I wanted to bring that up because I can guarantee that people are going to say, well, I don't see myself as an autistic person represented within this character. And at the same time, other people are going to say, well, I do see myself as an autistic person represented in this character. And the fact of the matter is that both sides can be correct here and can be true because autistic people are not a monolithic community. There are a variety of ways in which to exist, and the best way to improve representation is not to have a single perfect one, because that just doesn't exist, but to have a variety that run the whole gamut of potential configurations. Also, also worth mentioning at this point, because I am desperately trying to cover as many bases as literally possible here, there is the flaw of having a non-autistic person play the autistic person. This is a flaw because of the historic discrimination that exists within the acting industry, a discrimination that targets almost every minority, and in this case will often exclude autistic actors due to the perceived difficulty of working with them, or the perceived lack of capability on their part for just being autistic, even for roles that they should be a shoe in for because they have a direct immediate link to the character. That's one of those things that almost always bears mentioning when it comes to representation in media. Okay, hopefully this chapter made some kind of sense. And, and with that out of the way, what's going on with this transgender patient here, huh? And why did everyone get so darn uppity about the episode from, like, basically every side? I could see he was getting pretty mad about it. So, what's going on? Our first introduction to the trans character of the episode, Quinn, occurs within the first three minutes, so, you know, thank god it's quick to get to the point. 
Our initial reaction is that this is just a regular teenage girl who is dealing with some kind of medical issue, which is why they're in a hospital. <laughs> pretty, pretty wacky storylines in this here show, huh? There's a possible air of awkwardness from the parental figure here, who is a person of some relation that we currently don't know, but is babysitting her while her parents are out of town. But then we swiftly get our way to that scene that everybody across the entirety of Twitter and TikTok initially latched onto as a holy shit what the fuck is happening here, the moment that they find out that Quinn has herself a penis. That's a penis. She's not a girl, he's a boy. I want to talk briefly here about the part of this entire scene that was the problem that people took, which is the fact that Sean Murphy, the goodest of doctors, is played as being a boy genius savant like we mentioned earlier, but whose hyper capability is restricted by their complete lack of any sort of bedside manner, which is admittedly something important for a doctor to have. Now, what I learned from digging into the show was that this bedside manner thing is something that is developed by the character over time. They don't stop being brusque or direct with what they say, but they develop methods for dealing with patients that are built upon them initially doing stuff like this in the early season. This light is too bright. These rooms make him anxious. Can we take him home? No. Your son is jaundiced, clenching his right abdominal muscles when touched in febrile. He should not go home. What I'm saying here is that contextually there is an attitude of transphobia to the scene from Murphy, regardless of what they might have going on. The clinging to the idea that her biological genitals are the thing that define her gender is something that is going to be hurtful, especially for a patient who is meant to be putting their life in your hands. But at the same time, her babysitter figure, whose name and relation I still have no idea what it is, talks about how this whole thing is just a phase, and that she, secretly, he, in the babysitter's mind, will grow out of it, while Quinn herself consistently insists, please stop calling me a boy. How do you know you're supposed to be a boy? Your question doesn't make sense. I'm not supposed to be anything. I am a boy. Biologically, that's it. The final aspect of the scene to go over is the way that the other characters and doctors react to Quinn and to Murphy. They don't just get angry at him and tell him to leave, they explain the situation in a way that would be understandable, and it leaves him struggling to really have a response. And I don't think this show is necessarily tying his autism to his being transphobic, like a lot of people claimed from this scene. If anything, he's clinging to a stance that is antithetical to the research and to the knowledge that he should have of the say it with me now, by modal distribution of human sexual traits. Okay, look, we've got to work on that. Just remember that phrase for later on at some point, because I, I'm sure it will come up again. But his position is one that is getting agreed with by the parental figure babysitter here. These two are in the same camp, a camp that is not defined by autism. People of all stripes can be bigots, and have subconscious bigotries and logic that causes them to react poorly to minorities. It's just that Murphy lacks a social restrictions slash grace to not openly say it. Something that I think is also true of that other viral clip from The Good Doctor, wherein we see Murphy telling a teenage brown girl that she is a terrorist. I'm not prejudiced. I have evidence. Nobody's prejudiced. Everybody has evidence. And I'm always brown. <laughs> Maybe you're not so different. From context, it's not the show saying that autistic people are bad, or that he's in the right here. It's saying that our good doctor might have some internal flaws and issues that come from being raised in a rural Christian town, and from seeing and consuming American media, that causes them to have issues with certain people, which they're just more openly willing to admit to than others who will subtly nod their heads along in agreement. The show is not saying that autistic people are transphobic, or autistic people are bigots. What it's saying is that autistic people can be transphobic, can be bigots, 
And that's true for pretty much any group. Anybody could be a bigot. Nothing stops you from being that. Our next scene is when Quinn is going to receive some scans so they can figure out what the medical issue is because remember, this is a hospital show, I think. Murphy is continuing to ask questions that are to others clearly not something that is okay for a doctor to be asking. Basically, a bunch of stuff that tries to see if Quinn matches a gender stereotype that Murphy has clearly developed within his head. To which Quinn responds with good grace in an attempt to humour these questions when she clearly does not need to. Do you like the colour pink? <laughs> I'm more of a purple girl. Do you play with dolls? Since I was five, but I'm super into mermaids. Murphy then reveals to us a pretty big indicator for why he is reacting the way that he is. Partly, probably because of that earlier mentioned thing of being raised in a society that is not necessarily kind or welcoming to trans people, but also specifically because his medical training did not involve any kind of transgender healthcare or instruction around dealing with transgender patients. He's effectively going into this blind with zero experience, which can be a pretty terrifying reality for basically anybody. And so the reactions, while still something that is not okay and definitely should get him pulled off this patient due to the fact that it is not creating an environment for her that is inductive to good healthcare, at the very least we can now see the links that are causing this to happen especially with his hyperfixation on finding the answer to why this transness occurred, to trying to get the reasoning that goes against his currently constructed version of how gender and people work. Hello. Do you wear dresses? Murphy? Don't. Quinn is a boy who thinks he's a girl. I want to know why he thinks that. This is also indicative of another issue of a lot of doctors, is that stuff like transgender healthcare just isn't covered at all especially in America. Now, in New Zealand, we actually have a few organisations who are involved with the government to ensure that information is fed to doctors that will allow them to properly and respectfully treat with any trans patients that they might have, specifically in how it relates to the WPATH Standards of Care Guidelines, or the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, of which the very therapist who I went to see at the beginning of my transition was a contributor and editor for. But what we are getting an insight into from this conversation is the fact that yes, Murphy is ill-equipped to handle trans patients, but also all of these doctors are. None of them have had any training in their entire medical education for it, and so the question becomes not one of the flaws of an individual doctor, but of a system that is not helping to improve the specific minority's treatment within healthcare. Don't they have transgender people in Wyoming? Okay, transgender patient care was not part of my medical school curriculum. Was it part of yours? No. A minority who will often have a lot of contact with doctors and medical organisations by virtue of the dysphoria that they deal with. And so there is the big warning sign the show is directing us towards here. Also, the, the other doctor is correct in the situation. Murphy has just got to stop referring to Quinn as a he. It's, it's just like the most basic, basic, basic level to reach here in not upsetting your patients. Our next, next scene, and so far we're only 10 minutes into the episode because I can't seem to shut the fuck up and let it play, is them informing Quinn and her unidentified babysitter that she has that testicular cancer I mentioned from earlier. But not just that, as we also find that Quinn is on puberty blockers, one of the potential side effects of which is low bone density, specifically if you're only taking the blockers and not a replacement hormone therapy. Basically, it's an issue that can affect kids during the stage between when they take puberty blockers and when they begin whatever hormone will be best for them, or if they stop blockers at all, and, and decide to not transition, because hey, there are options. And this isn't in the real world necessarily a massive concern, as the low bone density will correct itself with the hormones. But as the medical staff say here, this is relevant information to be informed of, what medication you are on. And we discover that Quinn didn't reveal it, because her parents, who are clearly at least supportive of her transition enough to let her do it and to also go on to puberty blockers, didn't want her grandma to know which he says while looking at that babysitter from earlier. I've been on the pro line for nine months. Well, why didn't you say anything earlier? Because my parents didn't want my grandma to know. 
at this point, I'm so distracted by the fact that I'm trying to figure out who the hell this person is meant to be. Is is this the grandma? It, is it just some other family figure in her life? I really don't know. And Anyways, now we get to the crux of some of that transphobic family issues. The scene continues with the doctors telling us how the puberty blockers are not the cause for the cancer. Those are completely unrelated issues, but the Quinn will need to go onto a dietary supplement and might need to stop the puberty blockers as they are hurting her bone development. To which she responds with her piece about the fears of bodily change that can come with stopping that. The dysphoric parts that she wants nothing to do with. But the puberty blockers are hurting you. You'll be fine without them. Fine? I I don't want an Adam's apple or a deep voice or hair all over my body. You can't reverse that, can you? No, I'm afraid not. Now, Sean Murphy's character here says something a little subtle that might skip by the less keen noses of the Twitterati, because in an attempt to reassure Quinn, he tells her how girls have body hair too. It's It's not the best reassurance of all time, but it is an attempt to bridge the fears that she has of stuff that she associates with non-femininity by informing her of something that is a straight-up fact. A fact that a lot of people, mostly men, like to ignore or have become a method of misogyny to the degree that women will spend huge amounts of money and time to remove that body hair or those things from sight so that people don't call them mannish or think less of them as women because of it. It's a small detail, but it is important, I believe, for seeing where the character arc for the episode is probably heading. We'll get into that later. Our next scene, finally, finally, tells me who that babysitter lady is, as she refers to Quinn as her grandson. I finally got you, you slippery fuck. I'm sorry, that got unnecessarily aggressive, but at the very least, we can now move away from my frankly worrying obsession with who this person was, and back to what I promised to talk about here, which is Quinn and the transness of the whole episode. Now, they inform Quinn's parents, who have turned up and do in fact seem to be supportive, and they continue to be supportive throughout pretty much the entire episode, of the fact that there will be a simple orchiectomy to remove the cancerous tissue and that she'll be able to go back to normal function in no time. But Quinn gets mad about the fact that she has been advised to stop the puberty blockers, and how that will make her a freak to the other students and people she has to live around with. Baby, that's good news. No, not really. Without the puberty blockers, I'll be the freak in ballet with a mustache. Aren't there any other options? To which Murphy makes a suggestion of a bilateral orchiectomy, the removal of both testicles that effectively reduces the testosterone levels of the patient to a degree that is common within girls. Now, here is the thing. While Murphy is merely presenting a logical solution to the issue from the angle that he is seeing it, a big concern with children transitioning is the idea of permanent changes or permanent effects that in the long term is something they might not have planned for or understand. Now, in response to me bringing that point up, Quinn in the episode responds with her own good point that does sort of deal with the hypocrisy in that idea. The idea that this concern only really seems to go the way that targets trans people and trans kids, not really being concerned with the permanent effects that can occur from her having to deal with testosterone for the years until she can go on hormone therapy. And that is true, and it's why puberty blockers are often prescribed and used here due to the fact that they allow for the choice to be delayed with no long-term ramifications on the child. Except for in this case and this show, I guess, where the drama requires the patient to have to stop taking the puberty blockers, which are the obvious solution right now because of reasons. I, I, I get it. It's a show. It does need to have some sort of drama or some sort of thing happening that directs the plot. Otherwise, it would be quite boring. But, like... I think the problem with this is that it's showcasing that puberty blockers can be an issue, which just isn't generally true. Now, this orchiectomy thing is actually allowed to occur with parental consent, 
But we see here that while the parents are willing to consider it because Quinn wants it, the major antagonist of the episode begins stepping up. And it's that grandma who's using all those arguments that people use against trans kids right now. Quinn is a child who still plays dress up and make believe. He may want to have children of his own someday. I will not allow. It's not up to you. That's right. You thought the transphobic villain might be Sean Murphy. But it's the grandma all along. The next scene that I want to briefly consider is not one directly involving Quinn, but is instead relevant because it gives us more insight into Murphy. They don't necessarily believe that Quinn is a girl, or understand how that all clicks together. Like I mentioned, those subtle bigotries from earlier on are probably having some influence on that part. And that offering the bilateral orchiectomy to them was predominantly just because the doctor in charge of the case incorrectly told the family that there were no other options to deal with the situation. I don't understand why you suggest the bilateral orchiectomy when you don't even believe Quinn's a girl. I was answering Dr. Lim's question. She said there were no other options, but I found one. And now we're here. We also see how Murphy is taking pride and enjoyment in doing what is seen by Kalu, the other doctor guy in the room, who's been consistently trying to get Murphy to use the right darn pronouns. Well, Murphy takes pride in the grunt punishment work of writing up a comprehensive description of the options available to Quinn and their pros and cons. This whole scene, combined with an earlier comment from Kalu, suddenly makes something very clear in the comparison between these two. Murphy might be transphobic, and might have those bigotries that they express around a person's gender identity, but Kalu is only really being a good doctor here, or seeming like one, because of the fact that there is a competition in this episode between all these junior doctor internship people thing, whatever they are. I don't, I don't know the I don't know the term for it very well. Like, damn it, I'm a YouTuber, not a Dr. Jim and other non-Jim people. Kalu is worried for the future of his job, and that is affecting how he is responding to the patient and towards ensuring the correct treatment of the patient. Now, for Quinn, there is nothing wrong with that necessarily. From her end, the only issue that she is seeing is the direct contradictions of her identity and the misgendering from Murphy, but it's something to consider for us, the way that people might just be bigots, but they don't openly admit it. It's that thing from earlier on, where Kalu might not think of Quinn as a girl, but just doesn't want to say it. Whereas Murphy has no issue with saying it, because he doesn't see that as a problem. Doesn't matter, competition's over. Is it? We're in here, not with a patient. No FaceTime plus you calling her a he equals crappy survey scores. <laughs> it's okay. It's a game. It's not important. It is to me. <laughs> I'm a pariah. These scores are part of our resident evaluation. Our jobs depend on them. Now our antagonist, the monster looming over the episode of the grandmother, makes her play like a villain from... Game of Thrones. Does anyone remember that show? Like, what a fucking mess. And she makes a complaint to the hospital of child abuse by the parents because they're being accepting of their child's gender identity and attempting to do what's best for their child. Now, this is not an unusual situation in the hellscape that is America, especially in certain places like Florida, for example, recently, wherein people are told to inform on their neighbours if they believe they might be encouraging their kids to be trans, and empowers the state services to take children away from their families in those situations. The country is just unbelievably boned. And I'm happy to see that the good doctor... Okay, happy is the wrong word here. It's... It's good to see that the good doctor is at least recognising this as a way in which bigots attempt to attack and destroy the families of trans children. However, her grandmother has made a claim of child abuse against you and your husband. She's claiming that putting Quinn on puberty blockers, and these are her words, making her think that being trans is okay. Making it the main villain of the episode, rather than it being Murphy, as I think a lot of people who only saw a single scene or meme from the show might think, is a good choice, 
that gives us more of an insight into the troubles that these children can deal with when they have supportive parents, the very thing that we should be happy with them having. The grandma is the real problem here, and the hospital is doing their best to try and be supportive of the parents and to make it clear that they will defend the fact that the parents have done nothing wrong, something that unfortunately a lot of people in the same situation cannot say to have had a similar experience. But this action pushes the parents to consider the bilateral orchiectomy more intensely, as they hope that doing so will neuter the grandma's desire to claim her grandchild's life, as it is an irreversible choice on their part that will stop Quinn from being able to have kids, which is the big thing the grandma was stuck on, was the, oh, what if Quinn wants to have children at some point? If we let Quinn do the surgery she wants now, it'll all be over. There'll be no reason for Ruth to fight us. Do what Quinn wants. The fear of the parents here is very well played. The fear of their child being taken away. Of the grandma's clear insistence and doggedness in attacking them for their choice to be on their child's side. And of what would happen to Quinn if she went into a foster home. This continues into a discussion between the parents and the grandma as part of attempting to reach a negotiation over the dispute, with the grandma saying how all kids deal with some stuff like this and that most of them don't transition, and the parents saying how she has no right to be involved in this and that she accused them of being child abusers. All you gotta do is talk and listen and try to understand each other. Must understand, Ruth accused us of being child abusers. And what's to discuss? And it all leads to the parents describing how they reached this point of being supportive parents because they forced Quinn to present as male in public for a while and saw a marked decrease in her mental health and well-being until a year before the episode, she attempted to commit suicide. Became reclusive, depressed, and then a year ago, Quinn tried to kill herself. This sudden revelation of information, information that the grandma clearly didn't know, is something that seems to shock her, and is possibly something that might serve to help the grandmother realise what impact her attitude is really having on Quinn, and to maybe change it. Sometimes it takes someone close to us and in danger for us to realise stuff like this, especially for those who might be more sedentary in a mindset that is outdated and harmful. The continuation of the scene also sees the two surgeon consultants arguing with one another over the necessity of the bilateral orchiectomy, with one clearly being more level-headed in the approach that this can be the right choice if the child is committed to their beliefs and the parents trust the child, and also in regards to the aforementioned suicide attempt and concerns that come about with if they have to drop puberty blockers, that it might make them a potential risk. It's an elective surgery on a child, there is no medical necessity. Except with a previous suicide attempt, she's still at risk. While the other surgeon is committed to the idea that the surgery will ruin Quinn's future potential chance of having children, a line that is used for those that presume of kids that they have to be biological, or that considers your ability to pump out some babies as more important than control over your own life. But as we know by this point contextually from the show, this surgeon is committed to this line because of their own story in the episode that deals with the fact that he has low motility sperm and that's the reason why he and his partner, a partner who he reamed out earlier for waiting too long and focusing on her career for them to have kids, are not in fact able to have children. It's all my fault. This is the part where you say, no, babe, it isn't. You had goals, other priorities. He is bringing his own problems and his own current perspective on himself and his fears slash regrets into this consultation. But regardless of all that, the grandma makes it clear that she doesn't know if she'll ever be able to accept Quinn as a girl, to which the head of the hospital gives us the big emotional speech of the moment which is about questioning if it's worth sacrificing a life with someone you love over a commitment to an idea of them that might never be. I know what it's like to not put your family first. And it cost me, it cost me a great deal. And if I had to, 
do it all over again, I'd ask myself, is it really worth sacrificing a life with someone I love over an idea that may never be? And I agree with that concept here, that while she is hashtag problematic, I don't believe that the grandma doesn't love Quinn, or doesn't love their grandchild in whatever form they might think of them as. They're just stuck with having this vision of Quinn that isn't feasible or real, and they're doing some pretty terrible things to the family as they are clearly freaking out over what they feel like is losing that grandchild. Love can take many forms, and not all of them are healthy, or accepting, or beneficial. Sometimes it's toxic, and in some cases you need to cut those toxic people out, and in some cases, given time and very clear ramifications, they can bring themselves out of that if they care enough. This is a really powerful scene, and one that I can honestly only congratulate the good doctor for the direction that it takes with it. Our other scene at this time is also a pretty important one, and is perhaps the most important one of all to us specifically, a scene where Murphy is dealing directly with Quinn and has no other influences or doctor around to stop his questions. The first of which is how it feels to be a girl, which he immediately checks to make sure is not a question that was wrong for the situation, to which Quinn makes it also clear that she would rather answer those questions than have people stare or point at her. Are you angry? Was that an inflammatory question? i rather people ask questions instead of pointing and staring. Her explanation of the feeling of how it compared to what she felt like when she was forced to be a boy is one that links to the idea of freedom, a feeling right as who you are, rather than having something off about you and others not really understanding it, and it causing you to be distant and socially removed. It's about being different, but right. The kids at school didn't understand me, so they picked on me. I spent a lot of time alone. When my parents let me be me, I felt like I didn't have to pretend anymore. This scene is important because it is Murphy and Quinn connecting in a way over their shared knowledge of themselves. And the fact that Murphy is trying to understand others while clearly having this difficulty with only really being able to feel as if they know themselves. But in that way, we see that as long as you accept that others know themselves as you know yourself, then a connection can be formed there. A bond can be crafted through that acknowledgement of another's right to self and introspection. I don't know what it feels like to be anyone but me. Me too. It is a useful scene because it continues that notion that is a continual carrying through of many Good Doctor episodes. The idea that Sean is learning in all of these. That at the beginning there is information or situations that he's unused to and must deal with. And it details his journey to compromising and contemplating that as a way of existing, without it reproaching upon his identity as an autistic person. He doesn't have to stop being an autistic person, it's just that he needs to learn in his own way how to understand this. Quinn then needs to get rushed into surgery because the cancerous cell has caused some testicular torsion, which is not a fun time based on how it's described and the way she's vomiting like crazy. Yeah, torsion isn't a word you want applied to an area like the testicles, okay? That's just, it's just the, it's the wrong place to put that word. And now are two separate scenes here of Quinn dealing with some not fun stuff and her family working out what is best for her come crashing together as the family has to make a commitment right now, because the surgery has to happen right now. Ooh, the, the, it's the drama thing. Ultimately, the family commits to doing the medically necessary surgery and not the bilateral orchiectomy, out of fear that they might be limiting her choices in the future, and if she ever does decide that she wants to have children in whatever form that might take. You know, a lot of trans women are directed towards freezing their sperm if they're interested in having biological children of their own. And the parents reason that Quinn is a child and is too young to really comprehend what a choice like that can do in regards to long-term ramifications. You heard her when my mom said she might want kids someday. She can't even fathom the thought because she's just a child. Just 
just do what's medically necessary. Quinn is put into the surgery and, and some stuff goes down during the surgery. I don't know, it's a lot of like medical jargon, but it, it basically boils down to they got rid of the cancer stuff, but some shit is happening that isn't good. Everyone's having suggestions of what it could be, but nobody really knows until Cujo lifts up the clothing stuff and they see some bruising, which lets Sean have his savant moment that is, oh god, it's, it's fucking Sherlock Holmes shit all over again. I, I get it, I get it. It's a visual representation for us, the audience, of what is going through Sean's mind right at that moment and how is he making those connections, but I've been traumatized way too many times by genius characters being able to summon mental holograms around them or, like, interfaces. Shows just need to stop doing it. It, it scares me. I mean, at least Sean doesn't literally interact with it like it's some virtual interface, so it's not as bad as Sherlock, but it's... At this point, it's just a trigger moment, alright? A bunch more medical stuff happens, but it's clear that this was the right choice, and that working together, these two doctor people who have been at odds this episode have managed to save Quinn's life from whatever medical thing happened. Look, I, 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 don't, I don't freaking know this esoteric medical stuff. I... It's assuming that I assume that medheads love in their shows, much like how I'll freak out over the stupid-ass way that Doctor Who will say a bunch of science-sounding words that might as well be meaningless to anybody who isn't familiar with that show or world, but, like, I don't know medical stuff, so this is just, this is just word salad to me. EKG's normal, it's not coronary. CO2 and O2 are normal, so it's not a PE. Must be a reaction to the anesthesia. I'm already pushing fluids and vasoconstrictors. Quinn wakes to find that she has only had one testicle removed, and it clearly causes her distress to know that, to which the surgeon who was dealing with a bunch of family drama this episode over the low motility sperm jumps on the grenade and takes the fault for not being able to remove a healthy organ so that Quinn doesn't have to realise that her parents chose the option that was against her wishes. Now, this is a complex situation, and I can understand here that for a lot of parents, there is this case of having to do stuff for your child that you might not think they're capable of dealing with or of understanding the ramifications for at such a young age, especially with surgeries that are permanent or irreversible. I'm not saying that the parents are in the right, but I also don't think the parents are automatically in the wrong. This is a difficult grey area, that I don't think allows for such moral distinctions or definitive choices like that. But the parents respond to this by making the right call of taking responsibility for their choice, telling Quinn that it was in fact them who chose not to do the bilateral orchiectomy, which of course does to Quinn seem as if they're betraying her, that they're no longer on her side. Because for a child, it's pretty hard to understand the entirety of all that medical choice and stuff when you feel something to be true and want to make that choice for yourself. This was our decision. No, you said you were on my side. Hey, we are. Always. We haven't had enough time to talk. Not with each other, with your therapists, with your doctors. So I'm going to turn into a boy. It's rough. And Quinn is right to be annoyed and upset about this because of the fact that she feels strongly that she is a girl and can see the effects that going off puberty and having testosterone is going to have on her. And at the same time, the parents can also be right that this is a choice that was not easily made on the dime like this when you haven't had time to go over it with your therapists and endocrinologists and each other. The show forced them to have to make a choice right now and so they picked what they thought was the one that was going to have the least long-term ramifications if they were wrong. Quinn also gets a little lashing in on the bad sperm surgeon, which is what I will officially be calling him now, about how this obsession from people with biological kids is silly, because if she wanted kids, she could just adopt them. And you know what? She's right there. Cis people are always so worked up about having bio kids. If I really want a kid that bad, I can just adopt. And the episode ends our trans storyline with Quinn's grandmother coming to the hospital with flowers for Quinn. To which Murphy points out that Quinn doesn't like pink flowers, but Caillou says that she will probably like these ones because they represent the fact that the grandmother is coming around to accepting her grandchild as who she is because she loves them, not because she believes her to be a girl. It's... It's the slow work towards acceptance that I, I think is, is just an essential, perhaps, for some people. Quinn 
doesn't like pink. Oh. Uh, I think she will like this. I hope so. She's more of a purple girl. You know, the grandma is hopefully moving in the right direction of trying to better understand her grandchild, and to open herself up to being supportive and to accepting that who Quinn is could be permanent, and that her own bigotry towards that shouldn't stop her from being supportive or in Quinn's life. Murphy himself ends the episode having come round to understanding Quinn as well. Seeing her as what she is, and knowing more about her from what she's told him and related to him. Her. You get that she is a she. I have lots of questions. Yeah, well, questions are good. Leads to awareness and understanding, and who knows, maybe even acceptance. There is also clearly some link or connection here between Quinn and what Quinn said, and with how Murphy sees himself or wants to see himself. Specifically around how Quinn described being a girl as feeling as if she was floating in a pool, calm, serene. As we see Murphy at the very last moment scene, breaks into a swimming pool with his weird ass neighbour so that he can float in the pool too, to try and understand. You're not going to do any laughs or nothing? No. And what are you doing? understanding Whew. well that was quite a lot wasn't it really really covered the whole episode there and, and hopefully now we all understand a little bit more contextually about the good doctor as a show and about its trans episode removed from the snippet that did the rounds on the internet as a way for people to decry the show or for conservatives to weirdly connect with it the first big thing to touch upon here is the fact that the second bloody snippet that I saw of the good doctor himself shouting at Dr. Hahn how he is a surgeon when questioned about his legitimacy wasn't even from this episode. It's from a whole ruddy season later in a completely unrelated narrative and scene. I was waiting for it to happen and I realised very swiftly that Dr. Hahn wasn't even in the show yet at this point. And suddenly I started questioning not the legitimacy of the good doctor as a surgeon, but the legitimacy of TikTok and Twitter as a way to get any amount of media analysis. The second big takeaway, and one that isn't just a meme, is the casting for the character of Quinn. Now, a big thing that we cling onto in this channel as a problem is the way that many shows will choose to have either cis men or cis women play trans characters which comes with a whole host of issues around the representation that the audience is taking away from it, and also the difficulty for trans actors to make it in the industry due to that historic bigotry and inclusion that just seems to exist for every minority. But Quinn here is played by Sophie Gianna Moore, or Sophie Rainbows as you also might know her, from YouTube, and she is a trans personality who built her channel vlogging the process of transitioning and detailing the issue to transphobia that she deals with mixed up with the classics of like some fashion videos and makeup tutorials, which I suppose everyone has to do at least once, I guess. Here's my makeup tutorial. I don't wear it. I'm a very lazy person, and mascara makes me cry immediately. Unfortunately, Sophie's channel appears to have taken most of her videos down. I presume because she moved into legitimate acting and left the whole online thing behind for the bright lights of Hollywood. But for the good doctor, this is a great step. They had a trans girl involved in the acting and the process of delivering to us, the audience, the narrative of a trans girl. Someone who also went through the same process as their character, and so can bring a realism and advice to the writing slash production that it otherwise might lack. And you can see in the episode the benefits of this. As in our third point, which is the way that Quinn as a character is respected and given the opportunity to voice their own life and their emotions to the degree that we the audience are meant to be on her side and sympathetic towards her. She is sincere and believable and expresses ideas in a way that is digestible by anyone watching and that is also educational towards seeing the life of a trans child in America. We also, as I mentioned, get to see the strain that it can put on the supportive parents within the status quo the way it is. The difficulty that can exist in trying to do what is right by your trans child. 
None of it is played for laughs or for gross factor. There's a little bit of shock value in the initial revelation that might be distasteful towards some, and is from that scene that was clung to by people who called the show transphobic, but in the overarching context of the entire episode and its narrative, this is a positive trans story that attempts to give us a nuanced look at the various perspectives going into this, and imparts a lesson that is not a counterance to trans children or to transitioning. You know, I'll be back when I'm 18 for my gender confirmation surgery. And when you do, I'll be here to help you. It supports Quinn in her identity, but also shows us the complexity of those choices for a child and their family, especially when put on the spot by circumstances that don't allow them to go through a longer process. The bone density thing from the puberty blockers is, like I mentioned earlier, a little bit of a problem area. Especially because they don't make it clear that this situation is a rare case. And the issue is not the puberty blockers, but the fact that she's not currently receiving estrogen to support healthy bones. That's a minor medical flaw with how they present it in an episode that is overwhelmingly positive. I know this might not be the answer that a lot of people wanted. A lot of people were very mad at the show and wanted to be continually angry at it. But I can only interpret what I get, and what I get here is just not a transphobic show. I also think that the people who jumped on the good doctor as being on their side, the transphobes who pushed the clip as a sign of what should be done, are the biggest idiots here. The overall episode makes it absolutely clear that isn't the case, nor the conclusion at all. Yes, there are fuck-ups. The Autism Speaks relationship in the early stages is clearly a big indicator of that. And I blame that, if anything, on the fact that Autism Speaks has successfully moved into being the organisation that most people, especially not in the community, will just see as being the voice of the community, regardless of other factors. They are at the forefront, and that's not a good thing. But when The Good Doctor moved beyond that, we see that it is not really a bad blueprint for other shows to consider, in the way that they write and produce content for a similar manner. God, I might get murdered for this. But if you are making a trans episode, you could do a whole lot worse than taking inspiration from The Good Doctor. If you're making a show involving autism, though, maybe, you know, take some of the good stuff and, and drop the bad stuff the show did, you know, like, learn from their mistakes, if, if, if you're looking at autistic representation instead. So that's the video. And by god it was a long one. If you liked what you saw, and enjoyed it, or learned something, or wanted to show me how much you appreciate that, then have I got some news for you. There's a like button beneath this very video that lets you do just that. While you're down there, do you want to see more of my videos when they happen? Because YouTube put in this wacky subscribe option that lets you do just that. And if you want to share some criticism, or say some kind words, or just talk shit, then below that is a whole bar that lets you type almost anything you want into it, and others can read it. The internet is truly a modern marvel, the, the wonder of our age. And also, if you think to yourself, well done, I... I sure wish Lily had more money for these videos, so they can keep watching more trans episodes and telling me if they're good or, or bad or whatever stuff they say to sell me on this time, then the best way to do that is by going to my Patreon and subscribing there or using the hot fresh join button beneath this very video to become a YouTube member. Both of those are invaluable for letting me focus on these videos and produce them at the frankly unhealthy rate that I currently am doing. And the names of those in the $5 and up category should be scrolling past the screen right now. All of these people are incredibly important to me and the channel, especially because YouTube and advertisers keep telling me how what I make is not on brand for their sponsorships, so guess I'm not getting any of those anytime soon. If you're on Patreon, you're basically my, my sponsor. That's, that's, that's the sponsor I've got right now. Regardless, thank you for watching the video. And I hope you have a great day.